Amen. Thank you. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. And when you get there, say, uh huh. Dang, you guys are quick already. You're like Bible scholars. Incredible. If you're in Romans chapter 13, say, uh huh. Say, yeah. Say, word. I don't know. It's just fun. I, for, I forgot of things to say beyond that. I don't know. So when I preach, I would love for you to respond. So if I say something good that you like, say, uh huh. Say, amen. So let's practice. Say, amen. Say word. word. Preach it, white boy. Preach it, white boy. Mm, that's racist. Don't do that. That's inappropriate, okay? No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I would love that. That's my favorite one. Please do that, all right? So, hey, Romans 13, we're going to get into it. And if you look at it, it actually has a subheading uh, there under 13 that says, Submission to Governing Authorities. This is going to be fun. We're going to talk about submission. Yay. <laughs> Listen, submission uh, and, and, and submitting to authority is not like really kind of slick and cool and it doesn't feel exciting to talk about, but submitting to the authority that God places over us in our lives is actually a key to incredible blessing. And all those that you know it, say, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Say amen. amen. Say preach it. Yes, I like it over here. You got to get bold with it, man. You got to say it, you know? Some of you guys are scared, like, oh, preach it, white boy. No, don't do that. Come on, get some, get some attitude about it if you like it. I have been somebody that has traditionally struggled with the concept of submission, especially submitting to authority when I was younger, and I think I've gotten much better at it. But I wasn't always the most submissive person and the concept, especially of my leaders, my teachers, and the people that were placed over me, I thought of what they told me to do more of a suggestion than, like, the rule. So if I had a teacher tell me not to do something, I would take it into consideration, but I wouldn't always really do what they said. When I started out in my life of crime, I was in kindergarten. <laughs> Hardened criminal. So I come into class, and I'm, I'm out to run the class. And I was, I was trying to show Miss Needham that I was going to be in charge that year. Um, one problem, I did not know how to tie my shoes yet. So I had to go to her to have her tie my shoes so I could go run the playground, you know. So when my shoes came untied, I couldn't be the boss anymore. I'd have to go and be like, could you tie my shoes, please? But on one of those occasions, I was uh, out at lunch. And you all remember lunch? I don't know if you ever had these, but they had those milks that were in a bag. Anybody had bag milk? Anybody ever had bag milk? Raise your hand. Yes, a few of you guys. They didn't have it in a carton where I went to school. It was in a bag. And this bag, to me, was like a milk water balloon. <laughs> I thought, man, somebody made me a bunch of water balloons filled with milk. This is the greatest day of my life. So I collected all of the milk water balloons from my friends, and I started a milk water balloon fight because they were perfect for throwing at each other. When you're in kindergarten, you don't think much of the consequences. I got to tell you, I got in a lot of trouble for that. And my teacher came and said, listen, we're not going to have a milk water balloon fight anymore. That classroom stank so bad. <laughs> the next day at lunch, here are the little bags of milk. And they're like these, they were bags of milk, I'm telling you. And you put your straw on it and you drink from it. Weirdest thing. They phased them out because of me, I assume. So the next day, I realized that these water balloons, my teacher said, if you mess with these milks, they're to be drank, not to be wasted, young man. If you mess with them, you're going to get in big trouble. And I said... Okay, fine. She said, so don't you be throwing them. I said, I will not throw them. So I got the milk water balloons and I placed them on the ground and I figured out the next day that if you stomp on them, it's a milk grenade. And you can splash the whole class. I struggle with authority. My poor kindergarten teacher was brought to shaking tears by a kindergartner that day. 
I said, don't mess with it. So she drags me to the principal's office. And I remember this so vividly because I was afraid of the principal because he was an old, big guy. His breast stank and he didn't totally quite look at you when he tried to look at you. His name was Mr. Teddy. And I was always like, Mr. Teddy, I'm over here. He kind of had a lazy eye. He scared me. I didn't know if he was looking at me. It felt like he was looking through my soul. Mr. Teddy would, would look at you and his breath would just be punishment enough. I remember this as kindergartner. And he was like, Joey, what did you do? His raspy voice. And I remember Miss Needham is shaking. She's so mad. He stepped on milk. And I just remember that Mr. Teddy looked at her and looked at me, and he just starts laughing. <laughs> like this grown woman is brought to tears by a kindergartner because I stepped on milk. In his mind, he's thinking like I stepped through a puddle of milk. He didn't know it was a milk grenade. He didn't know that the previous day I had a milk water balloon fight. I have been notorious, especially when I was younger, for not respecting my authorities. And it started as a young age. God had to refine me. And through that process, I have learned to submit to my authorities. Now listen, it's all fun and games to be a little kindergartner and you're pretty innocent and it was honest fun. So then you, you come to an age where you realize that God puts certain people over you and you can either take what they say and you can submit and you can learn and you can grow and you can be blessed or you can fight and fight and fight. And how many of you have had to learn the hard way that that way is difficult? Raise your hands. How many of you are still a little bit stubborn? Raise your hands. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Romans 13 is going to talk to us tonight. And it's going to say some things that you don't like. It's going to attack your individualism a little bit. But hang in there because we're going to go somewhere. Are you ready? Let's read together. In fact, as we read the Word of God, let's stand together and honor the Word of God. Chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Man, that is one heck of a verse to start off. Can anybody say ouch already? Ouch. Yeah. Consequently, however, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do what is wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay your taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. This is not fun to preach, okay? I'm just going to pause. I would way rather preach you John 3.16, but I would prefer that you would be a well-rounded church and that you would know all the gospel, amen? amen? I'm talking about pay your taxes tonight. You're like, I thought I went to church. I'm reading the Bible, guys. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay your taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Now that is talking about honoring and submitting to the authorities given to us. Not just your pastors. Talking about governments. Think about when Jesus went before Pilate. And his response wasn't some big dissertation of why he shouldn't be punished. Instead, he looks at the man and says, you would have no authority unless God gave it to you. Basically, do what you want. Because you're only God's finger. Think about that. Wow. In light of the Roman oppression, it kind of starts to make our government look pretty good. I don't know when the last time we were threatened with crucifixion for standing up for what we believe. Even in that face, Jesus submitted unto a cross. Let's read on. 
Love fulfills the law. This gets a little bit easier for you. I know some of you don't like me right now. I know, but I'm not pre. None of that was my commentary. That was simply the Bible. So if you don't like it, you just have to rip out a chapter of Romans, okay? But then you're going to have to deal with God. <laughs> Love fulfills the law. Here we go. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Oh, that's good. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Oh, that's so good. Just let that wash over you. Don't be in debt except for the continuing debt to love one another. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's why you got to be careful if you're saying that you're correcting somebody in love. Because if you're doing harm to that person, love does no harm. And then it really gets good. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Man, when we step into God's light, it's like armor for our souls. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing, not in drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not Think about how to gratify the, the desires of the flesh. If you receive the word, clap your hands and shout hallelujah. You may be seated. So let's break this down quickly tonight. And then I'm going to warn you, we're going to end the sermon with some small group discussion, okay? So for all of you introverts out there, just get ready because I'm going to stretch you a little bit at the end of the talk tonight. Write this down. Even under restrictive and oppressive governments, the gospel bears fruit. Might I even say, especially under oppressive and restrictive governments, the gospel bears fruit. Don't think more of the powers of this earth than you should. But at the same time, honor them knowing that God controls everything. Understand that even in the midst of of communism and oppression. There is a church flourishing now, and we've seen a transition in China, but traditionally over the past 50 years, it's been incredibly oppressed, and even under the persecution of death and imprisonment, if you were to preach the gospel in China. I'm, I told you this story a few weeks ago, but I want to just reiterate it because it just makes me so excited. There was a pastor, and this was about 50 years ago. He was preaching the gospel in China, and, and the pastor gets locked up for preaching the gospel. And 20 years go by, and he's in prison, 20 years, and he's thinking, what has become of my church? And they release him, and they release him back to, to, to pastor, but he, they tell him, you can't baptize anybody, anybody, not even your own children, until they turn 18, and they come register with the state, then you can baptize them so we know who's getting baptized. You cannot preach the gospel publicly outside of your regular meeting time. And they put this list of regulations on him. Don't you know he goes back to his church, and at that time there was only 20 or 30. Within five years, some of our missionaries went to visit. And the church is well over 1,000 people. And it's these pastors from America talking to this pastor in China. And they're saying, how is it possible under such restriction, under persecution? Because you have to understand, this pastor was beaten and he was, he, was, he was persecuted and he was locked away. And even after they let him out, he was still under pressure. He was still under persecution. They were constantly messing with him and trying to keep him down. And they say, how did you manage to grow this church to well over a thousand under all of this restraint? We can't get anybody at our church back home to come. And he looked at them, and his answer was so simple. And he's like, how can you not grow the church? We have the gospel. We have the gospel. Friends, the biggest thing keeping us from the amazing things that God has for us is, is this dishonor of what we have. Almost coming under the oppression of a state makes you value and realize what you have 
and how precious it is. It's almost as if, it's almost like water in the desert. When you're sitting next to a vast lake and you have all the water you can drink, you don't much appreciate it, but when you're out alone and you're gonna die without that water, it's like so sweet. If you've ever been on a long hike or a long run and you just need water, oh, it satisfies. I think that's the power of the gospel in some of these oppressive governments. It's, it's like you've been sold all of this fake stuff and when you taste the sweet water of the gospel, it's like, wow, that's what I needed. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid when you see even our own government and even our own state, when you look at some of the laws that are being passed and they concern you for your future and the freedoms that you may have. Understand, as the culture shifts further and further away from God, don't be afraid because we have the real stuff. We have the sweet waters of salvation. Everything else is ash in the mouth. The state can't save us. The government can't create a program that will save us. There is no leader that will save us except the one that was given and he was nailed to a cross and he died for you. So don't look up to some government official. Don't look up to me as your pastor and think, oh, he's the one with the words. All I'm doing is reading the words of salvation. It's the gospel. There's no power in me except the gospel. And you have it inside of you too. You have the same power, the same authority, and the same spirit. So I say right now as we have freedom, let's preach in freedom. And if the day comes that we set under an oppressive government, hey, all the more let the church thrive. Let the church come alive. Let's wake up. Come on. Here's another thing you might not like. And write it down. There is no authority except from God. So you have to accept, if you accept the Bible, and I do, understand the Bible is my ultimate authority. Not your opinion, not my culture or my thoughts. The Bible is my ultimate authority. When I look at things and my opinion doesn't line up with the Scripture, I line up my opinion with the Scripture. When my heart doesn't line up with the scripture, my heart is out of tune, not the scripture. So when I look to my government officials, I have to say, whether I like them, whether they speak vulgarly, whether they even seem fit to lead, I will honor them and know that they wouldn't be there if not placed by God. Listen, the electoral college is a tool of God's hand. The popular vote is a tool of God's hand. The dictator in North Korea is a tool of God's hand. You have to submit if you're going to line up with the Bible, and I know this is uncomfortable. I know this hurts. But if you're going to line up with Scripture, you have to accept that all authority is given by God. And whether that is a good authority or a bad authority, God put them there for a purpose. King Saul was insane. King Saul was the type of person that would call in a musician to play him to sleep and then freak out and throw spears at him because he decided that he didn't like him. And yet he was placed there by God as a tool. We see this principle throughout scripture. We see David who was a good king and he was an honorable king for the most part. Yes, he had some failures, he had some stories, but he led well. But the principle is this, we honor and we understand that God placed them and it's not my job to dethrone them or decapitate them. I understand that I have the right to stand and speak and I'm blessed in America and I'm thankful in America for my first amendment. I am so thankful that I can speak the truth. I'm thankful that I choose to do it in love. <laughs> but I could identify kind of three views on government that I see popular in our culture. Let's look at them. Number one, I hear this often, the state is so corrupt that Christians have no business being involved. The state meaning the government, not California. The state is just so corrupt, Christians need to just, you know what, go buy some land in, in, in Alaska or something and just, you know, make a compound because this world is so, like, degradive and awful and, and we just need to pull back. And, and I don't know if, that's the right answer, but if that's your answer, I, I would, can, as much as I can, compel you to go to prayer on that, because I feel 
in my heart and aligning with scripture, that doesn't seem to be the right course of action. It doesn't seem to be what the Bible portrays for us in times of trouble and hardship is to go and hide. Number two, God has given the state limited authority. And I I will respect it when it's worthy of it. This is, I believe, the most popular um, approach. And listen, guys, I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal, I'm not a Republican, and I'm not a Democrat. So I'm not trying to push any opinion. My opinion is only the word of God. I try to push the word of God, okay? That's my hope here. I'm trying to be neutral down the line. And I know even in this, some of you guys are thinking, oh, there you go, I know who he voted for. You're trying to pick out who I am. You don't even know me. I'm just preaching the word here because we're all looking for our corner to go to so we can fight. This is not a boxing ring, okay? Get out of your corners. Come, let's reason together. Let's stop the insanity. Let's just look at the word, okay? Now, number three, Christians have a responsibility to make the state better. And I think even this is, this is true to an extent, but I see this get out of balance as well, that you have a mandate and a responsibility to make the government better. I don't know if any of those three are entirely accurate. They're the most popular opinions I hear communicating with young adults all the time. I think we are called to listen to the word of God, and when we have chance to speak, we speak, and when we have chance to do things, we do things, but our mandate was given by the word to honor those that God put in ahead of us. And if the day ever comes that I stand before a judge or a president or some ruler, and they are casting some judgment on my life, I hope that I have the courage not to cry and scream and say, I deserve my rights, but to look at them and say, you would have no authority unless God gave it to you. Do what you will. Don't worry. As the day grows to an end and the darkness starts to come and we see it in our culture, light shines brighter in darkness. You have an opportunity. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear ruin your life. The Bible does not permit us to rebel against or disobey the laws and regulations of the state. Nowhere in the Bible will you see that unless, and there's a comma, they clearly violate God's law. But the laws that do not violate God's laws, we are told to submit to. Told to submit to. Now, I am told to preach the gospel. So anytime, any place, anywhere that the opportunity arises for, for me to preach the gospel, I will do so no matter where I'm at, be it public, private, or secular, whatever in between, I will preach the gospel at every opportunity given because that's the mandate I was given by Christ. Matthew 28, 18, I'm going to do that. Lock me up, throw away the key, I don't care. It's inappropriate, whatever. For me, that's a mandate on my life. I'm not going to shake on that. You can say, oh, this is a place where you're not allowed to speak like that. This is a a state-run school. Well, listen, if I have the opportunity to preach the gospel, I'm going to preach the gospel. Lock me up, throw away the key, do whatever you got to do, because my God will shake the walls and get me out of there if I still have a mandate. It's all good. And if my God wills that I set in a cell, then I set in a cell. If my God wills that I get out of that cell, then I get out of that cell. But... There's no power in the lock that holds that chamber. The only power was given by God. When you have this understanding that no one, no thing, no structure, not even America has the power to contain you if God doesn't will it. I hope I'm messing with you tonight because you look like you're getting a little bit confused. Some of you guys are looking at me like, "Uh, Pastor Joseph, but I... I'm American, and I'm on the land of the free, a home of the brave, and I got my rights, and after all, I am an American. That's how some of your faces look right now if I could hear you talk. You gave up your rights as a citizen of this nation when you became a citizen of this one. (laughs) So, yes, I will be the very best citizen I can, I will, I will be honorable. I will pay my taxes. I will give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, <laughs> so to speak, or Washington what is Washington's, yeah? Lincoln is Lincoln, so on, right? I will give to the state what they require. But if it violates God's law, 
Do what you will. I honor God's law. Anybody say amen? <laughs> this is good. So we have this section here really digging down on the submissioning to governing authorities. And you got to understand, Paul's writing to the church that's in Rome, and there is a great, great oppression coming in on the church. The church is viewed not as a recognized religion at this time. Judaism is a recognized religion, and Judaism is protected under Roman law. Christianity is considered a cult at this time, and so when you convert from Jewish to Christian or you convert from anything else to Christian, you are instantly setting yourself up against the state at the time. Understand that. You are setting yourself up and saying, I don't believe that Caesar is Lord, but Jesus is Lord. In fact, to say Jesus is Lord flew in the face of the fact that everyone said, hey, Caesar is like a god. and We worship him. And then you come out and say, no, I choose to worship Jesus. And they say, oh, the one that we killed, the one that we murdered on the cross, you're going to worship that guy? Oh, no, but he rose from the dead. Okay, guys, come here, listen to this guy. He's worshiping that Jesus from Nazareth. He says, Jesus is Lord. Okay, did Jesus, Lord, build Rome? Caesar did that, okay? We, the people of Rome, did that. There was this pride and this arrogance. And when you stood up and said, I'm a Christian, I give all honor to God, you were spitting in the face of that governing authority. Make no doubt, we have traces of this even right here in this so-called Christian nation. And it's only going to get harder. It's only going to be darker. But once again, light shines brightest where? In the darkness. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The Bible says in the last days, those that know God will do great exploits. Oh. Then it comes into this section about fulfilling the law. So we go from this oppressive government and Paul saying, anyways, submit to them. They were put there by God. Okay, this government was taking Christians and people that didn't agree with it, putting them into the arenas and letting the lions loose and letting them be ripped to shreds for entertainment. I cannot stand it when people say, America is just too far gone. There's never been a nation like America. We are so awful. This is just so bad. I'm like, what are you talking about? Literally everything has already happened, but like way worse in Rome. The sin, the violence, the debauchery, the drunkenness, the sexual immorality, it was like way worse in Rome. And everyone's like, oh my God, it's never been this bad. Like, have you like read the Bible? It was pretty bad. <laughs> I'm just trying to put it in perspective tonight, guys. We always want to be like, this is the worst ever. We want a reason to rise up. We want a reason for revolution. We want a great cause for our life. We want to march with the picket signs. We want to be the next revolutionaries. I promise you, if you'll simply live out the gospel, you will be the most revolutionary person that the world has ever known. Like love, let there be no debt remaining outstanding except the continuing debt of love. Like the continuing debt of love. When you look at your fellow man, you are indebted to them in love. Can you imagine if you owed me like, like a $5,000 debt or some like $10,000 debt or, or just some massive debt, like $100,000, something like that. Like your kid was sick. I had the money. I gave it to you for the operation. You're indebted to me $100,000. Can you imagine how you would feel around me? If I was the one that you were in debt to for that, right? You would, you would like, I would imagine, treat me pretty good. Why do we treat each other like trash? We're supposed to be indebted to each other in love. We're supposed to act like, man, I want to pour my love out as if I'm paying back this debt to you. I want to be so intentional with my love for you. That it's like, man, I've, I've got I've to pay this back. Like, and don't get legalistic about this. It's not a have to. But he's making an analogy here of that feeling of like being in debt and that pressure that it puts. He's saying you should have this same sense of urgency and almost pressure about you when you're interacting with the saints of love. Man, I've got to love you. I've got to pour it out on you. I have a debt to you. Man, I love this so much. 
You owe a debt of love one to another that is never paid off. It says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is it. This is it right here. It boils down to this. I wonder this morning when you woke up, if you thought about what Pastor Joseph was going to have for breakfast. Probably not, because that's kind of creepy, right? (laughs) But it's in our nature to wake up and think about what I'm going to have for breakfast. What I'm going to wear. I need to brush my teeth. I don't wake up and think I need to brush Eric's teeth. That's weird. That's creepy. But this highlights the fact that our nature is is selfish. We think about ourselves. I need to clothe myself. I need to wash myself. I need to feed myself. I need to satisfy my needs. I need to take care of me. So, once again, if the analogy of the debt doesn't play enough, he tells us so clearly, just, just, uh, what could, I, what could I say to these people? I could almost see Paul riding through the influence of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaking to him. Love them like you love you. Pin drop, feather quill. Yeah, they didn't have mic drops back then, so it was really anticlimactic. <laughs> love does not harm. So don't tell me that you are doing something in love when you're harming somebody else. You know, somebody have really harsh love, a lot of people do, very harsh, kind of mean when they're correcting or when they're saying something. Love does no harm. True love does no harm. So, so, so that, that goes straight out the window. And then it says it's time to come and wake up and live as children of the light. So I love this children of the light thing. I want to rest here for a moment. So we've talked about authorities, we've talked about love, and I want to camp out on children of the light. Seems like kind of a sporadic chapter, but I don't think so at all. I think it all wraps up really nicely. Children of the light. Clothe yourself as children of the light. I want to read to you a prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. I want you to just close your eyes and just let this wash over you. Most high, glorious God, Enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, wisdom and understanding, Lord, that I may carry out your holy and true commandments. Amen. I want you guys to read that and make it your prayer right now. I think it's so appropriate. I think it's so well written and so concise. Come on, let's make it our prayer together. Read with me. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, wisdom and understanding. Lord, that I might carry out your holy and true commandment. Amen. This is our prayer. This is how we clothe ourselves in Jesus. When you come to Christ and you hear these edicts that were given, like honor authority. (laughs) And you look at some of the people that have been placed over us in authority right now, even in our own country, you could be like, really? Honor? Honor that girl? Honor that lady? Honor that guy? That filthy mouth lady? That terrible, debaucherous man? That guy that just passed that evil law? I'm supposed to honor them? God's, God's saying tonight, I put that person over you. And then we, then we move on, and we, it's like one step further. Okay, that's, that's the country and all that. Okay, now, now act like you have a debt towards other people when it comes to your love. Okay, that's not good enough? All right, love others as yourself. Okay, you got it? These are, these are putting on Christ. This is, this is kind of how this chapter wraps up. It's like, put on the light, put on Christ. But you know, sometimes when I put on Christ, I feel a lot like my little kids. And I go into my room sometimes, and they've got my boots on, and they got, like, they're trying to walk around in my shoes. The other day, my little baby, she's two, she got one of my shirts on, and she's, like, floating in it. Sometimes when I try to put on the concepts of God, I feel like my kids, like, in, in these oversized shoes and shirt, like, Dad, I'm trying to be like you. Your clothes don't quite fit me, Jesus. I'm trying to be clothed in you. But I look like a fool. <laughs> You know, tonight, we're touching on some touchy stuff here. Honoring government, how do we love each other? How do we put on Christ? 
This isn't the typical three-point, this is what this chapter means, because none of these concepts are easy. One, two, three, this is how you do it. I'm inviting you to kind of be like my kids. Let's put on dad's shoes. (laughs) And even though we stumble and walk and we look silly, let's love the best we can. Let's choose to be clothed in Christ. And this is the grace I know that God has. Just like me, when I come in the room and I see my girl, I'm laughing right now. My little baby with these boots on today. Like, like I don't have a giant foot, but they're like size 10 on her little feet that's like an inch big. Like, she's like, ah, she's like tripping and falling. I'm not like, you stupid kid, get out of my shoes. No, when we put on Christ's clothes, like that's what the scripture says here. When you put on this clothed in light, you're clothing yourself in Christ. It feels awkward and you feel like you don't quite manage it. Father God swoops you up and says, good job, son. You make me so happy. Oh, you're so awesome. Oh, I love you. Come on, keep going, keep trying. Don't give up. I know we're stumbling through some of this stuff in life. I know even in our nation right now, we look and we're like, God, what are we supposed to do? Do we take to the streets and riot? God, do we vote? What do we, do we get involved or do we recluse back into the darkness and do nothing at all? Do we write strongly worded Facebook posts? I don't know how to react sometimes. As your pastor, I'm telling you, man, I look sometimes, I'm like, God, what do I do with this mess? You've put me here in this time. Sometimes I feel like the little kid with the shoes that are too big, trying to, trying to be a good citizen, trying to love my family and my friends, trying to pastor this group. But I know this, here's the cure. Just put on the light. Just put on Jesus. Just clothe yourself in righteousness, and you will not be turned away. So here's a couple of questions. How do we clothe ourselves in Jesus? If there's any practical point to this message, here it is. Number one, be baptized. And I don't just mean be dunked in water. Baptism is nothing but a ritual if it's not death with Christ and resurrection with Christ. I am dying to Christ, with, with all of my sin and all of my failure, I am dying with Christ, and now I am coming up and I am rising with Christ. I'm being born again. So that's step one, be saved, be baptized. Number two, Act like Jesus. I tried to make this as simple as possible because this chapter hit on such heavy issues. I want to make it real simple for you that want to start walking towards it. Act like Jesus. What is that? Love. Those those things that we clothe ourselves in is humility. Humility. Hey, maybe before you make that politically biased post, you should just take a little bit of drink of the humbleness, right? Maybe you don't know everything. Maybe in heaven your party wasn't right after all. Oh, I know I'm making enemies tonight. I don't care. Number three, train yourself in spiritual weapons. So I kind of made this progression. Be saved, begin to act like Jesus, and now you learn how to fight. Once you grow into those clothes and you start to learn how to move, it's, it's called prayer, Bible study, fellowship, meditation. These are the tools that sharpen your spiritual weapons. Prayer, Bible study, fellowship, meditation. Not like, but I hey, one with the universe. I'm talking meditation on the Bible. Read the Bible and get it inside of you. Meditate on the word of God. You guys want to hear a joke? Okay. What did the Buddhist monk say to the pizza clerk at the pizza counter? He walks into the pizza restaurant. What does he say? He's Buddhist. You guys with me? I got I to gotta talk slow for some of you because you're like, I don't get it. So the Buddhist goes into the pizza place, looks back at the chef. He says, hey, make me one with everything. I got three kids, guys. I got dad jokes. You better watch out. I got an 11-year-old. I got an 8-year-old. I got a 2-year-old. I am locked and loaded on the dad jokes. You better watch yourself. They're coming at you. You want another one? Why does Cinderella never make the baseball team? Because she runs away from the ball. Duh. So train yourself in spiritual weapons through prayer, Bible study, fellowship, and meditation on the Word of God. Do you receive the Word tonight? Clap your hands. Shout hallelujah. (laughs) If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, we 
are a messy group of people that are really trying to follow this Bible the best we can. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves disciples. We don't get hung up on all of the, all of the phrases that people want to classify us as, but whether it be political or of our faith. We're simply people trying to follow Jesus. Call us Christians. Call us disciples. Call us followers, whatever you want. But if you want to join us tonight and follow that man named Jesus that they crucified, that people used to mock those Christians back in Rome and say, oh, what an idiot for following that guy we killed. I invite you to the group of fools, so to speak, to be mocked and ridiculed, to be looked down upon. If you're truly going to stand for this, I invite you into the way of the early church when people will look at you and not understand you. But you'll join a movement where we see signs, wonders, miracles, amazing things happen. You'll have the Holy Spirit inside of you. He'll comfort you. He'll speak to you. And when the whole world laughs at you, he'll be right there whispering comfort into your ear. He is so real. He is so close. And he is so near. And he's calling you home tonight. If you don't know him, I'm inviting you to. Join us. We're figuring this thing out the best we can. We're reading the gospel every day. We're trying to understand and follow Jesus as closely as possible. We're believing that God could change our city and our world. We believe that God's going to change this area around us. And I invite you, join us. Follow Jesus. Don't follow me. I'm just a guy. And you're not going to like certain things about me. If you're coming here and you're going to get saved right now, some of you are, don't think I'm anything. I'm just the guy chosen to preach right now, okay? I'm just telling you what Jesus says. So I'm inviting you. If you are living in a way you know God's not pleased with, even in your heart you're convicted right now, you know you need to make a change, here's the fact. The Bible says you have to respond, and you need to do it publicly. It's never meant to be private. But if your heart is burning and you're like, man, I got to respond. I got to. I know I need to get right. If I was to die right now, I know I wouldn't be right with God. I'm asking you to get right with God in front of everybody I'm just going to ask you in a second to raise your hand. And don't be scared, because if you can't raise your hand in front of a bunch of Christians, I don't believe you can live it out in front of a bunch of heathens, okay? There's Christians that were torn limb from limb by lions, burned at the stake publicly. So God will give you power. He'll give you strength. But you need to step out in boldness a little bit. So I'm going to invite you to just step out in boldness right now. If you need Jesus, nobody's going to look down on you. But I'm inviting you right now just to raise your hand up and say, Pastor Joseph, that's me. I need Jesus. God bless. God bless. God bless. God bless. I see you. I see you right there. Okay, thank I see you right there. Thank you. Thank you. I see you right there. Thanks, sir. I see you. God bless you. God bless you. Was there anybody over here? I saw somebody going like this. I didn't know if you were getting saved or getting scratchy, you know, scratching your head. You're just scratching your head. Okay, cool. That's fine. Sometimes you got to scratch your head. Just don't do it during a salvation call because you get me excited. (laughs) I thought people were getting saved and you're just scratching your head. Just wait a second, okay? (laughs) Hey, I love you guys so much. I, I really do. And it really is my honor to be chosen as your pastor for this season. And I hope this season lasts my whole life. That'd be cool. But however long it lasts, I'm inviting you into the true culture of the word to honor and love and humility, okay? Hey, if you made that choice tonight and you want to follow Jesus with us, I just want to invite you to take the first step, whether you're going to get baptized tonight, and if you're, if you're saved and you've never been baptized, do it tonight. Don't wait. Or if you just raised your hand to get right, go to these smiling people that are waving right now. Get up out of your seat. If you raised your hand, and I want you to go right now. I want you to go right now. And everybody, let's stand to our feet as they go. Let's stand up as they go. If you raised your hand or if you need to be baptized, I want you to go now. Go now. Keep it going for them as they go. Keep it going. Come on, keep clapping for them that are going right now. You're just getting saved or you need to be baptized. Either one. Go now. Come on. (laughs) That's good. Come on, keep it going. I think we still got some trickling right here. Let's go. Keep it going. You keep clapping for... Come on, keep clapping for him. That's awesome. That's good. That's good. All right, you may be seated. We're not done. 
We're not done. We got a little bit of work to do. We got a little bit of work to do. These are some questions to consider, and I want to do a quick evaluation of where our hearts are at tonight. And we're going to do it in a group format. You might think you're really good on these concepts we talked about tonight, but I'm going to put some questions up. I want you to find two or three people, and I want you to go over these questions. And I don't want you to feel pressured to, like, buzz through them really quick. So if you have kids in kid care, kid care will be closing in about 10 minutes or so. So if you want to grab them and invite your kids even to join your group discussion, that's really cool. Okay? But if you are someone that considers yourself a part of the upper room family, that means you come here fairly regularly. I want you to stand to your feet right now. If you're newer or you don't consider yourself a part of the, the family yet, I, you can stay seated. But if you're part of the core, you, you come all the time, even if you've only come a couple weeks, but you're like, hey, I'm part of it. This is, I like this. This is cool. Okay, those of you that are standing, I need you to find a group of three or four, but it can only be made up of people that are sitting. And you're going to lead this group discussion, those of you that are standing. With that, that's how we close tonight. God bless you. We love you. No matter what. Adios. If you got to go.